The, I'm here with uh, Ed O'Connors, uh, who's given us this space, with Frank Goldwasser, who did spend time in Portland. How many years did you...? Well, from, like, uh, from, from 2005 until 2000... Uh, what, what, this is 2013, 2011, I guess. Yeah. So how, has it been it's a like few six years? years? That's about six years. Yeah. Do you get back regular, or do you...? I, I've been able to come back um, every few months. I was here in April, now it's August, and I'm probably going to come back in December. So there's, I, there, I, there's, uh, uh, there's a good music community here, you know, and uh, I've been very fortunate to, uh, to become a part of it. And, uh, and I want to, you know, I, I, that's some, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, I don't want to lose that. Oh, I understand. You yeah. know. I don't want to lose the support and the you know the, the connections, the friends, you know the the uh, opportunities to play. So uh, well, yeah, so I try to I make it a point I mean, to, to come back. You know. Every, every so you're traveling quite a bit. Well, I'm, I, that's that's the one positive thing that came out of this move is that because there's so little for me to do down there, it's 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 really it's forcing me to travel mm -hmm. more, which is really what I wanted to do anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wasn't doing very much of that while I was living up here. So, um, so yeah, I've been traveling a lot more in the past couple of years than, than, uh, than ever before, really. What, what is that, how has that affected you musically? What is it like to, to go into a town and you get, you get to, you get to experience different musicians every time you go? No, no, no? because, well, no, some of the travel, a, a, a lot of the traveling that I've been doing is with, you know, as, as a member of a band called the Manish Boys out okay. of Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Let's uh, talk about that a bit. Okay. okay. So yeah, so I've I've done quite a bit of traveling with them, and I've also uh, been going back and forth between um, Europe and and California. And when I play in Europe, I I, I play with you know people that I know. Right. Uh, there's a band that I. Uh, play with which is based out of Paris and we those are people that I've known for 30 you know for even longer than that 35 years that's all right you, you were right. asking about traveling and, yeah traveling yeah. and if you had to play with different folks every time well, yeah I mean of course there are times when I have to play with different people yeah. and um, you know it's there's I've been fortunate enough to, to be able to play with people that are you know really good at what they do um, so it hasn't been a problem, but it's always on the back of my of my mind. You know, what if it doesn't click with these people? Right. Or, you know, it right. can happen. Um, mm -hmm. It's. You know, it can be challenging. Yes. It, it's it, it is it's always it's challenging. I mean, every time that I play, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's. Uh, you know, it it's not a. I have to get over my. Uh, my, my fears and my, you know, my anxiety about, you know, doing the right thing, pleasing the audience, you know, oh. pleasing. So, so it's always challenging in one mm -hmm. way or another. It's never easy. It's never, uh, you know. What, when you played the Lodge the other night, which was kind of a, a fun little gig for us in the audience, but that was a pretty relaxed... Well, well it is, although... Playing in that type of, of environment, where you're, it, what is, you know, the, 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 it's such an intimate setting, yeah. and the audience yeah. is so close, that can be, that is generally more intimidating to me than playing a larger venue where you, it's kind of, you know, anonymous. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When when you play in front of a large crowd, you don't, you're not able to look at people in the eyes, and right. it's, you know. It's, it's, it's less intimidating than playing in front of a very limited crowd. For me, I know it's kind of a contradiction. It's kind of... Yes. You know, but it is, you know. 
Because when you're playing in a, in a setting like a small bar and you can really, I mean, the people are right there, you mm -hmm. know, just feet away mm -hmm. from you and you can feel their, you know, their... Yeah, yeah right. It's that, to me, that's always been, you know, more, uh, more intimidating. You know, for any young musicians coming up that are going to spend their life in music like you have, when they hear you say this, I'm sure they're hoping it's going to get easier somewhere along the line, you know, to be able to... Or for, you know, for some people it, it, it does become easier, I'm uh -huh. sure. And, you know, in a way it does, because the more experience you have, you know, the, the better you get at what you do, uh, that, that aspect of it is easier. But for me, you know, the, the, it, you know it's, it's always... Uh, um, you know, there's always fear of you know being you know of not being accepted of really? yeah you know that's just that, that's me you uh -huh. know that's it, you know mm -hmm. um, yeah it doesn't matter if there's only three people in the room uh -huh. you know there's still going to be that fear of not being accepted by those three people you know it's and and you've been playing music how long a, a third well. 30 or m more than 30 years 30 years roughly 31 32 and so did you know right from the time that uh, you heard music that you were this was your destiny this is where you were going well, I'm still questioning whether it's really my <laughs> destiny and whether it's really what I should be doing you know <laughs> believe me it's you know, sometimes I really feel like you know what am I doing what am I right you know, I understand sometimes I feel like I you know there's, you know, there's, somewhere along the way, there's been a big mistake, and I'm really not supposed to be doing this, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know that that is what I do. And um, how did you get snagged early on? Well, um, how did I get snagged? Yeah. You, you know, when so when someone asked me this question. I ask myself, do I tell him? There's two answers to that question. But if, if, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you want to hear. Yeah, I want to hear from your heart. Yeah, what, what your okay. journey was in life. Okay. All right. Well, this is what this is what happened. It was it was very much of a metaphysical experience, you know, uh, because I, there's no other way that I can really uh, um, interpret it really. When I was going to, when I was in high school in Paris, uh, you know, I was, uh, I didn't have much of an interest in any kind of music. Well, I, I, I can't really say that. That's not entirely true. My, my father exposed me to, uh, to a lot of music when I was little because, you know, he really loved to listen to music, a wide variety of music. But as a teenager, I had kind of, you know, I didn't really have a strong interest in any kind of music in particular. One day I heard a tune on the radio, which was really big in, in France at the time. It was a, it was a song by a Canadian group called Beau Dommage, mm. uh, a French Canadian group, and they had this, they had this huge hit. And the title of that, and it was it wasn't blues. I mean, they were you know they were a, you know how would you describe it? They were you know a pop group really, and they had this one song, which made a reference to blues in the title. And for some reason that I cannot explain, because it just came out of nowhere in a way. It, it, it made it so one day I walked into a record store on my way to school or on my way out of school and I asked for a blues record. And I, and I remember, you know, how could I forget this? This is 1976 in Paris, you know, and uh, the guy had two blues records to choose from. And, um, one of them, uh, I, so I, I asked him, well, you know, how is one different from the other? And, you know, uh, so I really didn't know what I was getting. I didn't. Know, I had no idea. You you hadn't touched the guitar or anything yet, or? Uh, no, I I had touched the guitar because my father had a guitar, okay. although he never learned how to play it. It was always <laughs> laying around the house, mm -hmm. and uh, and I had messed around with it for a few months, and then I put it down. So anyway, going back to that uh, to that record store, I asked him. So you know, 
in what way are they different? He said, well, the, on this, this is, you know, this is, this guy plays electric guitar, and on this record, the guy plays acoustic guitar. So I said, okay, well, I'll take this one, you know. It, and it turned out that it was, um, this record was uh, Hound Dog Taylor's uh, Natural Boogie. Who was it? Hound Dog Taylor. Okay. He was a Chicago blues man. And this is in 1976, and this is, I can't tell you exactly what month it was. But in retrospect, it turned quite interesting. I had a um, very vivid dream, and I almost want to call it a... I, you know, I know it sounds a little bit you know, uh, new agey or, you know, however you want to put it, but it, it felt like a visit, like I was visited, really. It was a very, very visit, vivid dream. Mm. And the dream was that I was visited by this older black man who came and sat at the end of my bed and didn't say anything, just grinned, just looked at me and grinned. And... I, did too, I didn't make too much of it, really. And then time passed, and it just occurred to me that this guy who I, who I, that I, who I had seen in my dream was the guy that was on that record. You know, I went back and pulled the, took the record out, and I said, and it was, you know, there wasn't any doubt in my mind that this is what I'd seen. This is the guy that I saw in that dream or that, you know, that vision. It was yeah. like a vision, yeah. So I put or out apparition, something. Yeah, I yeah. pulled out the record and played it and then from that moment on I was I was hooked. <laughs> so to, that's a long answer to your question, but that's how it happened. Um, <clears throat> so from that point on I started, you know, buying every blues record that I could find and ordering, you know, getting a subscription to Living Blues magazine and uh, but what's interesting in retrospect, what I was saying earlier is that later on I found out that Hound Dog Taylor died in 1976. So it's just, so, you know, so. So he would have visited you in spirit. So, you know, you make whatever you want yes. out of it. Yeah. It's just, you know. But this is the way it happened. Right? You know, whatever it really was, it, it's, it makes a good story, I think. It does make a fabulous story. So that's story. how I got hooked on it. And, um. And from the time that I got interested in this music, I mean, it was more than just an interest. It was just, it was really a passion, a very profound, you know, passion. And you were how old, about? And I was 16 in 1976, 16, okay. yeah. And you were in Paris yes. still? Yeah. And Paris loved the blues? No, no. no, I, I, really, no. Well, you know, Paris loved the blues. I mean, from, from my perspective, you know, I didn't know anybody who had an interest in this music at all. It was, it was a totally solitary thing. I thought that was, you know, I thought I was the only person in, in the world who wore, or at least in, in, in Paris, uh -huh. who, who had an interest in this music, you uh -huh. know. Uh, little by little, I, 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 I realized that there were other people who liked this music, but most of them were uh, people who were older than me and who were, you know, record collectors more than, they weren't musicians. Uh, okay. But those were my first... Uh, um, Opportunities to meet people who also share that 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 interest with me. So I beca I started to write about the music. Uh, I wrote for a magazine uh, called Soul Bag mm -hmm. because that was really the only opportunity, the only way that I had to, to become to do something. Uh, and of course, I got serious about playing guitar at that, at that time also. Well, that isolation was it, was it like wood shedding, and you just practiced, and you just got. That's all I wanted to do. I get it. Okay. That's all I wanted to do, um, and that's all I did. Were you supported? Did your family support this? Um, to a point, yes. I'm yes, I, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I I have to give my 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 parents credit for this. Yes, of course. My father bought me records. He took me to shows. You know, he, you know, yeah, he did, absolutely, he did support me. But when he realized, when my parents realized that, you know, how 
serious I was getting about this, they started getting a little bit annoyed because you know I, w I was going to a very uh, uh, very expensive art school at the time. Mm -hmm. Ah, you're, so you're an artist, a visual artist as well. Visual, yeah. Uh huh. Although I haven't done anything with it in, in 30 years, but mm -hmm. that was initially that was the direction that I was going. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, and you know, so it got to the point where you know I, they were they were sending me to this extremely expensive, you know, uh, pr prestigious art school. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that, you know, I didn't have any interest in it. And you know, the more interested and the you know, more serious I was getting about, you know, this music, the less serious I was getting about, you know, my studies. And so that, that obviously did not go over very right. well. But, um... How did you, how did you finally decide that you were going to leave Paris? Because that had to be a well, profound moment in your life. Uh... You know what? It's it's funny, but I never really, um, I never really made a decision in the sense that it was ever something that. It's almost as if um, there came a, there came a time when I was really there was there wasn't a question. It's not as it's not as if I had pondered it and made a decision. You know, one decision versus. You know, going versus not going. It's, uh -huh. As soon as I got really, just really serious about this, it, it was uh, kind of. That's just you know. I realized that's what I needed and wanted to do. You know, it got to the a point where I I felt that I was getting. I felt that I was getting really good at what I was doing, but I had no way to test it. Uh -huh. okay. I mean, and you know. And, you know, I after a little while of doing this, I started meeting, you know, going to concerts. I started meeting people who were my age and who were also, you know, players who also played this music. So I started playing in a couple of little, little bands, and you know, but I felt that the only way that I was gonna, really going to test myself and find out if I was really, if I whether you know I was cutting the mustard or not, mm -hmm. or not was coming to America and, and playing and doing this music here because this is where it came from. Oh, you know, this is where it originated and that's where that's where that, That's you know, how you got here. Yeah. So what that's yeah. You know, so that's that's how So I, which city did you go to first? I, I came to Oakland. You came to Oakland and And the reason why I came to Oakland you know, as opposed to other areas like, you know, Chicago for instance. Right. Was because I had a relative in Oakland and my family um my family came from Poland originally, Polish Jews, mm -hmm. and uh, my grandfather's oldest brother had migrated to America in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So I had relatives so from the, from my father's side. I had American relatives, and in particular, uh, a cousin who was really you know more, more like an uncle to me because of the age difference, but. He was actually a cousin. And I came to Oakland and um, looked him up. And he very generously took me in and let me stay with him for a while. And I was the first member of our family to make contact between, you know, the, 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 the side that had settled in Paris and the side that had settled in America. They hadn't been talking for, I don't know, 50 years or something. There was no, there had been no, very little contact basically no contact so I was very the first family member who kind of made contact so you know he was touched by that and he took me in and he and he really made it possible for me to stay because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to to stay in the country did he did he have an interest in music did he understand your passion I, I think that he did I think that he did I think that he did yeah yeah what was interesting that you would land in Oakland because Oakland is literally a volcano of everything that happens on the planet, yeah, and music is at the top of that. Well, and also, yeah, also I should point out that uh, I mean, having a relative in Oakland was was uh, a decisive. I mean, it really, you know, helped me in a major way. But I also have to say that the music that I was really interest, interested in at the at the time, and the musicians that I was really interested in, in playing with, were Oakland musicians, you know, like Sonny Rhodes. 
uh, you walked into that whole hornet's oh, uh, nest of yeah, yeah. So I know I knew where I was going. Oh, you, oh, know, you did. Okay. I, you know, I looked up Trotsky and Elias Mile High Club. I, I knew where I was going. I had, you know, I had, you know, I had uh, already been reading about it. And, you know, the artist, the history, the, the, the Jimmy McCracklin. I mean, I, I knew where I was going musically. I knew very, very precisely. Who were the people that I was going to be looking for, and uh, you know? And so, when you first went on that scene, was it like nowadays where you go to a jam and you do your thing? And no, no, it didn't happen that way. And I was, happen. and again, I was very, very fortunate, extremely fortunate, because what happened was I, my first trip to Oakland was in 1981, and uh, and I got my introduction to the the, the Oakland scene at first as a journalist. That's the way, that's what I used to get in, uh -huh, okay. you know. I looked up the artists, club owners, whoever I could, and said, I write for this magazine. So I, I was in immediately as a journalist. Mm -hmm. and, when, and once the connection was made, then I let it be known that I also played guitar. Mm -hmm. So I got in that way. Uh, so during my first trip in 1981, I started sitting in with a lot of, I, but I didn't go to, I mean, I did go to some of the jams, but, but right off the bat, I was, I was in through the back door. You know, mm. I, I had, I was invited to play with some, you know, Stellar heavy, yeah, yeah, right off the bat, you know. And um, once I got a taste of that, Whoa. you know, I went back to France, went back to art school but it, it was you know my heart was you not were already it. gone yeah, yeah exactly so I went I came back to o I went back to Oakland in 1983 and and I'm still here 30, 30 <laughs> years later uh, so yeah when I came back to Oakland in 1983 I looked up one of the guys that I had connected with two years earlier Troy Ski who was the owner of um, uh, a notorious uh, Club, uh, Eli's Mile High Club. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So I hooked up with him, and it just turned out, it just so happened that he was firing his guitar player, and he, want, he wanted to replace him. So he asked me to do it, and that this is like within weeks of you know arriving. So immediately I, you know, I found myself, you know, in the scene, backing up, all, you know, all, all kinds of, you know. Legends, people that were my heroes, that you know, the Jimmy McCracklin and the Big Mama Thornton. Oh, did you, I, I, I'll never forget when I saw her. Big Mama. Yeah, yeah it was at the end when she was drinking milk and whiskey. That's right. what I had played with her. In oh, 81, you did. Yeah, around, I yeah. played with her in '81. Uh huh. So anyway, so yeah, to answer your question, I, I, I never, right, you know, right off the bat, I was in. I was in, and uh, I didn't have to go to the jam sessions where you wait for hours and you put your name down on the list and wait to jam. I never needed to do that because right away I was taken in by by these guys, by these people, the musicians in Oakland. And they took me in, and, uh, and that's you know, yeah. well. So we began our conversation with yeah. you. Talk, we talked about destiny and how you're maybe still struggling with that yes. in your own way, but. As you tell your story, it's pretty clear that some kind of light was shining on you. been an artist my whole life. Yeah. I don't I don't know how to I could never do anything else other than that. I mean I, I you, I'm like you I don't think this is who I am it's just this, yeah. the way I'm going to leave my body I'm going to leave that way. So what is the, the when you when you go into the dark night of your soul and you question yourself mm -hmm. what is that question you ask yourself? What Uh, 
Um, well, that's not an easy question. No, to answer. it isn't. I know. And 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 it and it, and it, and it, it stirs up it stirs up stuff that's pretty personal and that for me to really answer that question, it would force me to you know expose myself in a way that probably would take more time than what we have. Right. And, and let's it's, not do it, but it is a question. It's just, that, it's basically, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's around the, the, the issue of whether or not, you know, I, I'm legitimate in doing this and, uh, you know, uh, you know, legitimacy and, that, uh, and that, whether or not it was, um, how can I put it, uh, Legitimacy and you know, do I have the right to do this? Do I have the right to play this music? Do I have the right to be here? You know, uh, taking this, this uh, doing what I'm doing. I don't know how to put it really. Well, I think you, know, you didn't. You know, it seems to me that you didn't have any choice. And that's that's really that's you're right, that's really the way I feel about and that's it. That's a hell of a statement. It's almost as if I never had a choice. Yeah. And because we all have choices, no matter what we're doing in life. But about the thing, about the journey of your soul, I'm not so sure that we have. I guess you could turn away with it from it, but what would you? Why do you, you know my, the burning question I ask? Am I honoring the gifts that I've been given? Yeah. Am I honoring those uh, to the best? Can I reach my full vibration in this life? And I don't know any other way to reach my full vibration yeah. but the arts. And, and I don't do anything without music. I can't imagine. I can't imagine being on this planet without music. Not that I don't think there's music out in the woods listening to a river run, but we're talking about a different kind of music. Mm -hmm. And so, it's just, I think anybody that would listen to this and say, you know, for you to still be asking that question when it would be obvious to anybody listening that you had no choice. You were called. Yeah. Every I mean, one step, it, yeah. the light was, you put took another step, the light was shined. And here you are as humble and as, as dedicated well, as you I, once were. I yeah, mean, I don't think I'm humble. You don't think so? No. I found you humble. No, I have pretty... <laughs> Anyway, it's going. Oh, it's I, not well, going to let, that. Let, okay. No, I, I. Yeah, I don't. I mean, no, I, I don't. I don't think I'm what you would call humble. You know. Well, but to still be questioning yourself. Oh yeah, I have self. I, think I have self a, doubts. Of well, course. I call that humility. You're not going for it. <laughs> no, no, I, I. You know, no, I know because I know myself. Right. It's not. It's not humility. It's not the same thing. You know. Uh, okay. Uh, You can have, you know, there can be two extremes. You can, you know, on one end you could be, you know, just totally, you know, tormented by self-doubt and questioning whether or not you're legitimate in doing what you're doing. And and the other extreme is, um, you can, you can, at the same time, you can have that and you can have a totally inflated ego and, and think that you're God's gift to the... <laughs> back right. and forth between the both, yes. you know, yes. and, and, and that's what really drives you nuts, you know. Well, the ego is an irrational master. You know, one day it's basically. one, and the right. other day it's like, you know, you just want to, you know, shoot yourself and get it over with. <laughs> you know? But so. music, music has been your life, in this lifetime. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when, yeah. when you think about it, you know the gifts that it's given you, <clears throat> as opposed. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges and heartache in, into being a musician and trying to survive oh, in it's this world. It's crazy. It's, it's insane. Uh, it's it's just plain stupid, actually. <laughs> I I understand. And, you know, and it's never ending. It seems. No, you know, you know, and there's. I mean, it's particularly if you have if you're challenged in other ways. You know, I mean, uh, as you. Undoubtedly, you, you know, being an artist, uh, having talent, whatever that means. I mean, you know, you know. To me, talent. What talent really means is the desire, the desire to accomplish and do something and doing it. That's talent. But anyway, 
between that and and actually being able to deal with you know with with the uh, reality of life with the you know the the the, 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 the material you know uh, aspect of it you know uh, survival and you know functioning in the system and all that you, you know you can be good at one and not at and not be good at the other yeah. <laughs> and it's uh yeah, yeah. And at the same time, you know, and that's the struggle I think of most artists. Uh, no matter, even even if they even if they've made uh, a lot of money and they can afford to have all that help, it's still a challenge. They the physical world still demands of them. It demands of their 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 heart, their soul, their emotions. It demands of, of the density of of the physical uh, of, of the physical experience is dense, no matter where you are on the ladder. Yes, I'm sure that's true. Psychically, it can get to you if it can't get to you directly, right? I mean, the world the way it is. Yeah. And, to, and then being on the other side of things, knowing for myself, as I made this journey <coughs> through life, as I made the journey through the times of Vietnam and all the, all, all the challenges without music, I don't know how I would have made it and stayed buoyant and positive and you know the, the ability to embrace the passion of life over and above it's because of music and so for all of us who feel that way I hope you feel that your life has had great value because it's kept a lot of us going oh, and nothing well, else would. Thank you that's really that you know there is no you know higher you know, compliment really than uh, you know there isn't you know. So I wanted you to talk about, you know, we've talked about your past, but I wanted you to share with us where, what you're going to be doing and where you're... What I'm working on really now is trying to, um, to build uh, uh, my, uh, well, my, my career, I guess is the word for it, in, uh, in and around France. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm going. I'm going to Europe in uh, in September, and we're gonna. I'm gonna be playing uh, in France, in uh, the Netherlands, mm -hmm. in Germany, in Denmark, Belgium. So that's what I want to be focusing on now, because uh, I think that's where I have you know better opportunities and. Um, less competition, can mm -hmm. I say that? Mm -hmm. You know, and a, a shot at, you know, uh, being acknowledged, you know, for what I can, for what I have to offer. Uh, so that, yeah, that's what I'm going to be focusing on from now on is, is trying to go to Europe as often as possible, probably two, three times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a rigorous schedule. How long do you stay usually when you go? Well, like I said, I just spent six weeks and in, 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 uh, mostly in Paris, my, based in Paris, because that's my, that's really, it's, it's my home, it's my hometown. And uh, I was in Spain also, different places, but, uh, but that's exceptional. Usually I don't stay that long when I go. It can be as little, it can be as little as two days. I have flown over to, you know, to Europe to play one show and flown back well, here. Well. It can be as little, you know, it can be two days like it can be, it, like it could be two months. And so the blues is more accepted today, would you say? It, it, well, also that's a, it, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. I mean, everybody has a different perspective. You know, if you were, you know, if you were to ask, you know, a, a French musician who lives in France and, you know, who plays this music, the answer would, you know, undoubtedly be, you know, forget it, you know, it, it, right. you know it, right. don't even think about it, it's, you know, it's, there's nothing for us, and that would be his reality for, for somebody who, in my position, which is, which is different, because having, having lived here as long as I have, I've actually, I'm, as of last year, I've, been, I've lived in America longer than I've lived in, than I've lived in France. I've kind of, you know, 
Mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm on the other side of the, mm -hmm. whatever you, you call it. So having lived here for 30 years and played with the types of people that I've played with, I feel like I have, you know, a kind of, you know, credibility that sets me apart, that puts me in a different category. I see. You know, uh, what's always plagued uh, uh, European musicians in Europe is the fact that um, for the longest time, if you were European, if you were not American, mm -hmm. you could not, nobody would take you seriously. You're playing American music and you're not American, you're just a local guy, you're an American, you know, you're not gonna, you know, nobody's gonna give you the time of day, you know, nobody's gonna take mm -hmm. you seriously. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you're not the real deal, you're not authentic, you know. You know, only Americans, preferably black Americans, are you know legitimate in playing this music? That's perspective in Europe. You know, it's very, it's changing very, very, very slowly. In certain countries, it's 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 moving faster than in others. Hmm. Uh, you know, for example, ju yeah, just to give you an example, in Scandinavia, uh, my experience from what I, you know as an outsider, I've, I've gone there a couple of times, is that the Scandinavians are much more accepting and supportive of, of, of their own musicians. You know, they don't, uh, they don't, you know, automatically write them off because, because they're local, you know what I mean? Yes. But, you know, that's just an example. In France, for instance, uh, France is, it's, it seems like France is is behind all the other countries in terms of uh, well, it's, it's a very you know it's a very old system in France it's very static things don't move very slowly uh, the, I'm talking the mentalities as well as the uh, you know the, 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 the well mostly the mentalities but things move very slowly it's very difficult to get anything done so there are very few venues there are very few venues for musicians and those venues are very uh, are very difficult to uh, to uh, what am I trying to say and, 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 and oftentimes they're not they're not accessible to a lot of you know uh, of the, uh, players who are on location because you you, you are always, you know, uh, you always have to deal with the, this obstacle, mm -hmm. that, this obstacle that you are not authentic and you will, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to be taken seriously, you know. Um, although, like I said, it's changing very slowly, it's very slowly. Um, now you see French bands, French acts booked on on music festivals in France that used to be never, that used to be unheard of that used to be unheard of it just could not happen now you see, and there are you know there are different reasons for that I mean one is that the mentalities are very slowly changing and now you know the the, the, the public as well as the you know the uh, people who are in, you know in authority position in the music field you know whether it's club owners or you know promoters, record companies, they cannot really ignore the fact that there's a whole new generation of people who have devoted their lives to playing this music and who are, you know, who are valid, who are, you know, who are authentic, mm -hmm. you know, and who cannot be just, you know, brushed aside simply because they were not born in America. Or, you know. So very slowly, the mentalities are, you know, um, moving but uh so going back to the you know to what you were asking me because of my journey because of you know i i have a, a type of credibility that sets me apart because so yes i am that, because yes. yes i am from there but you know you spent 30 years here yeah so you know uh so it opens certain doors for me 
you could capitalize on I'm it. able to... Yeah. Uh, European bands cannot export themselves within Europe or anywhere else. Um, it, it's very, very rare. It almost never happens that, you will, that you're going to see uh, a German blues band playing in France or a French blues band playing in Belgium. Mm -hmm. People, you know, you, if you're lucky, if you do well, you might be able to be accepted in your own country, but you cannot export yourself. You know, you're not going to see you know, an Italian band playing in, in the Netherlands or vice versa. You're, you, find it, you can't get out of your own country. Because of uh, my experience and time that I've spent here and the people that I've played with, I can't export myself because I'm looked upon, you know, uh, as an American act in a way because, you know, because everything that I've ever done and that, that's ever been um, looked at or listened to, I've done it here. This is, this is where, you know, I, this is where I've, I grew up as a musician. You know, so it so it puts me in a slightly different place that I that I want to exploit because you know I'm at a <laughs> I'm at an age now that I'm starting to really worry about you know what's going to happen in the future you know in the years to come and I have to think about not only you know the artistic aspect of, of, of what I do but you know the business it's got to work yeah. if it you know it. it if it doesn't start happening, you know, uh, I'm going to have a real problem. Do you, so at this point, do you have a manager? Are you thinking, no. no. Are you going to think about I mean, somebody that can really... You know, in this field, I mean, there's, there's so, uh, so little money to be made that there aren't any managers. I mean, there, you know, the times, it, you know, it's not like in the old days where you know, um, some guys, some total unknown guy is playing somewhere and there's a guy in the audience who hears him and, yeah, yeah, I believe in this guy, right, you know, right. I'm going to become his manager. That doesn't happen anymore. If you haven't already done all the groundwork yourself, if you haven't really, you know, if, yeah. you know, nobody's going to, you know, nobody's got, nobody wants to do that, 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 that work for you, you know, you, you, you have to have, you know, everything in line already to be of any interest to it. To, uh, there's no money to be made, you know, you know, uh, so, um, but it does sound like because you spent this time here, you can return there. This sounds more of like that whole path that you're that destiny that is kind of weaving its way mm -hmm. in your life because you see that there is an opportunity. How much of a financial opportunity, I don't know, but yeah. Well, you know, I'm not. I'm, I don't think I'm. Be, I'm unrealistic. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know that there isn't money to be made in this field. So, you know, I'm, my ambitions are not. You know, uh, I think my ambitions are fairly. You know, realistic. Just to be able to. You know, survive. Really. Right. That, that's really all. Right. That's all I'm asking. Right. You know. Um, um, the other thing that, that uh, yeah, I got sidetracked. What I was saying earlier about how the mentalities are changing and the, and the system is becoming a little more accepting of European musicians in Europe. And the other thing that's happened, and that's not a small thing, it's a very, very big thing, is that mus musicians, European blues musicians, have gotten a lot better, you know, uh, 30 years ago people could people in, in Europe could not play this music I mean there were exceptions but, mm -hmm. but you didn't have there were no rhythm sections there were no drummers who could play a shuffle there was nothing like that mm -hmm. but now there's a whole new generation I mean 30 years later there are guys now who are you know between the ages of 30 and you know 40 whatever who have grown up listening to this stuff who've been doing it for 30 years mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are guys over there now that, that are just equally, mm -hmm. that are just as good as, you know, anybody in America. So you, can't, you cannot really argue with that, you know. So that, that makes a big difference. That makes it so somebody like me can go to Europe 
as a single by my, I can go over there by myself, mm-hmm. pick up a band over there, and and have something that's that's going to sound pretty good, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's working at, you know. So the consequences of that are that it makes it easier for American musicians to go over there by themselves and pick up a band over there and put on a show and get booked. Mm-hmm. Economically, that's really the only way that th- that you can do it nowadays. You know, um, but and and also at the same time, what's really great is that it makes it it makes it so there's more work and more opportunities for European bands, because there was a time when, uh, you know, the, the simple fact, it's just that, that you know anybody uh, anybody could go over there and 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 uh, and, and get booked and get and and get generate some kind of interest simply on, on, on the uh, basis of being from America you know that had enough uh, in itself because you come from America necessarily that means it's it's you know comes from over there it's authentic it's it's the real deal whatever but now it's different because you've got bands over there or you know better than American bands or at least that's good mm-hmm. in some cases better mm-hmm. you know and it's and there's been so so many you know crappy American bands going over there to play yeah. that that that's that's changing I mean it's still you know it, there's it still works you know still people I still you know ha- have the fascination for things that are American but um Again, you know, that's, it's not like it used to be at one time, you know. <clears throat> so if, if you had a choice, where, where would be the ideal place for you to live? And, to live? Yes, to live and center, center things out from there. Well, it would be Paris because it's, you know, it's, it's really the only place where I feel completely at home, you know. And it would be because, you know, you couldn't go anywhere from Paris. You know, you can south you're in Spain, north you're mm-hmm. in the Netherlands, Belgium, um, German. Is that, you know, mm-hmm. is, um, you know, you go east you're in Germany. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, on the other side of the, uh, you know, you got Italy, right? I mean, you can go anywhere from uh, from Paris, being based in Paris. You know? And musically, you were in an ideal situation, and at least for playing music. What would you like to accomplish at this point, this juncture of your journey? Uh, really, the most important thing for me to accomplish, besides, of course, uh, the ability to you know to survive and 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 for my family to survive, you know, and not have to worry about, you know. Uh, how are we gonna, you know, pay for next month's rent? You know, aside from that, that's obviously a priority. Just, what I would like to accomplish is just get to a point where, you know, where I can just simply uh, accept who I am and that I, and what I do, and just become, you know, be, you know, find peace, you know, with that. Just, you know, not go back and forth constantly between you know, the, the, the 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 doubts, the. Uh, the Questions about legitimacy and, the, and all that. Just, if I could just, you know, find a peace of mind with that. That's all. You know, that's. You know, I don't have any. Uh, I used to, you know, I used to, you know. I mean, everybody does. Every young musician feels like he, he wants to leave his mark and you know and you know, be you know the, 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 the and just do great great things. You know, I don't have those kinds of uh, uh, you know. Uh, Fantasies anymore, really. Mm. Is this a smoking section out here? You know, if I can just be uh, acknowledged, you know, for what I for what I have to offer, mm-hmm. you know, that that would be good enough for me. You know, it's uh, it remains uh, uh, for me uh, a, a challenge that somehow before I leave my body um, that I would like to see musicians honored the way they should be honored and that more and more 
and I can't explain it, occupies my mind. Really? Really. You know, now, you think I'm just wasting my time here? But it is becoming an obsession. That's why I be, I started Soul Blast. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a person that, that believes in other other people's limitations. Well, I'd like right? to see musicians get basic respect, like yes. like any other uh, in any other profession. Yes. Just like as much respect for what they do as a, a locksmith or a mason or, you know, just that's enough. Yes. That's enough. Yes. You know, just get you know minimal amount of respect that any other uh, person gets. You know, for what they do. And mo in most cases, they don't. Musicians don't get even that, that kind of respect. And you know, um, once in a great while, you know, if you, if you're lucky, or if you're, you know, yeah, you will play in front of a crowd who's, you know, uh, not, not even forget the crowd. But I mean, you know, not, more often than not, you find yourself in situations where you're playing for uh, I'm not even talking about the audience I'm talking about people who, who, who hire you who book you play with people that don't, sometimes they, don't, they probably don't realize it they don't have the, they don't have any respect for what you're for what you're you're providing you know when you're, when you're playing in a bar and you're playing and I'm not this is something that I've experienced many times and any musician who Here's this is going to completely know what I'm talking about. You play in bars where there's televisions going while you're playing, you know, and you know, and people start clapping, and 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 you think they're clapping for you, but no, they're clapping clapping for the football game on TV while you're playing, you know. Excuse me, you know, but fuck that, yeah, I, you know. Yeah. But you know, if you're a musician, you know. This, and this is how you make your living. You consider you consider yourself lucky to even have the gig. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> and yeah, for every time there's a major disaster, a flood, a hurricane, a tornado, or whatever, and, and people are devastated, who steps up to the plate? It's the musicians that put the benefits on, that rake in the money. It's over and over and over again. There's such an imbalance here. There's an imbalance. And I don't know how it deteriorated into this, but I'm going to have this dialogue. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm going to beg the dialogue. I, I can't accept it. I don't want to accept it. I might, I might not be able to, to uh, prevail, but I'm going to beg the dialogue. And, I, and it's not just going to be between people like you and I. Mm. Uh, it has to go. It, you know. It, People have to recognize uh, that what music has brought to this, without music in this world, m many people could never find any common ground whatsoever. Yeah, that, 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 that is so true. That's true. And yeah. music is so direct, you know, yes. I mean, uh, uh, it's, you know, not, it's not, not, not that it's any better than any other art form, but it is direct in a way that... You know, when you look at a painting, first of all, you have to go and find the painting and look at it, and you have to make a you know certain effort. But music just hits you in the guts, you know, just right off the bat, whether you like it or not. Yes. And that's the way that I, that I feel. Yes. You know. When my grandfather used to say, "Well, if you want to talk to a beautiful woman, play music. <laughs> if, if if you want to talk to your enemy, play music." If you want to talk to God, play music. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the influence that music... Confucius said, anybody who understood uh, the tonal uh, gifts, uh, the qualities of music, and understood um, the timing and the rhythm and all that comes with it could rule the world as if it was spinning in their hand when they when they understand that the gift that music brings to the soul I don't know what better medicine that there is uh, than music and how we as uh, 
a, a, a race of people, uh, Homo sapiens, how we've come to take it for granted, to not honor it, to not treasure it, and to not treasure those that make all the sacrifices to make it, mm. to me is a tragedy that is not acceptable. Uh, not to me, uh, and I think to so many it's others. It's just too bad, yeah. It is too bad. Yeah. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not, it, you know, for something that enriches so many to be, to be uh, not recognized for that. You know? Yeah. you know, my father was, he was, a, he loved music, he, we had music in our house, he was a singer and a dancer, and, and and when I moved to San Francisco and all my friends were musicians, and he said to me, sweetheart, those are the real treasures of life. Mm -hmm. He meant that. And I mean it. And so for those of us who live that and breathe that, I think it's important for us to speak out. And it is, believe me, because it's, it's, it's really wonderful to, you know, to hear you say that. It really is. It helps in a tremendous way because yeah. <laughs> sometimes I swear sometimes I'm like what am I doing in my life? You know, where did it, where did it go wrong? You know? Right. I, yeah. I I know it. You know, I used to stand on the corner and catch buses in San Francisco and say, you know, if you weren't an artist, you would be driving a, a car. You wouldn't be out here in the cold and the fog. You know, you ask you yeah. You know, you ask yourself, and, and yet you can do no other. Uh, well, maybe you could do something else, but it certainly wouldn't be well, and it certainly, I'm just not able to. So, for me, at this age of where I am, and have been around artists and musicians my whole life, I do want, I do want us to raise our voice. And that's really the essence, besides honoring the the people that support them uh, is is for Soul Blast to to present this, uh, and I think I think we might find that we when we when we present it that way uh, that we might wake up a few people. In the arts, one of the things I always say because I'm thick into it, uh, the music musician the community. Uh, is the most underserved population in the arts in any major city, no matter where you go. How could that be? They sustain us. Uh, it's, uh, as, this, this is not acceptable. And we need to rethink this and we need to do something about it. So we're going to have these dialogues. When you come back to town, you and I are not through talking. <laughs> okay? Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed this. Me very too. Much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're done. I think. Yeah. No, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's, this was <clears throat> important. This was important. Thank you. Sometimes I find myself saying stuff and, and like, and that's what that's not what people want to read or hear. But I, I, I just don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to bullshit. I don't know how to. Right. I don't know. How, I just don't know how to. Right. Just you know. And lie. why? Why would you even want to? Yeah. You know, I've had to calm it down because I'm a very direct person. And I see that many people were offended by that. They weren't. When I lived in San Francisco, nobody was offended by that. You know, I didn't have to. Here, I have to be careful. Yeah. They're very fragile. These people. So, I try to. I don't want to hurt anybody, but I don't want to uh, carry on a bullshit dialogue. It, it, you know. Yeah, exactly. I'm too old for that. Right. You know. Thank you, Brand. You were very patient. <laughs> We got it together. Well, are we on time? So yeah, that I'm fine. I'm I don't fine. get in trouble with John Masako? Okay. It's fine. It's perfect. All right. So Well thanks again for your okay. interest. That's the R Starts on the guitar, everybody. We have Frank Goldmasa, Bill Tim, Jim Mallard, all sorts of other people. John Dave Mallion on the drums. John Zacco on the bass. I'm Dave Fleshner. This has been the uh, Ben Rice. No Rice. The No Rice Man. The No Rice. The Man. The No Rice Man.
We've had a delightful evening here tonight. And thank you all for coming out. And uh, please come again next time. Some, someone will be here next week.